This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, the Fairchild Channel F made a brief appearance on the channel recently and you said you wanted to see more of it. As Leslie Nielsen might say, it's not fair and there are no children in it, but it does deserve its place in the history of the development of video games consoles. And it does deserve to have a spotlight shone on it, particularly as it was so often obscured by the shadow of competitor the Atari 2600 or VCS. So let's take a moment today to find out what makes this second generation 1976 games console stand out, how it came to be, and if the F in Channel F really does stand for fun. Our console today goes by a number of names. Originally released in North America in August 1976 for $149.95, this was known as the Video Entertainment System or VES by Fairchild Semiconductor. That makes it the first console to be released of the second generation. The most prominent of that generation being the Atari Video Computer System, which reached retailers over a year later following production problems in getting it to the market any sooner. It was the VCS branding of the Atari console which prompted Fairchild to rename their console the Channel F to differentiate the product from its rival. The Channel F was also licensed and sold in other markets including Japan and Europe. Here in the UK it was sold by Adman Grandstand who retailed it as the Video Entertainment Computer and that's the example we've got here today. Grandstand a name which would become well known in the UK for peddling handhelds, tabletop games and low-cost edutainment computers. The Channel F appeared in two guises, the System 1 and the later System 2. The Grandstand VEC variant I have here is a rebranded Channel F System 2, the differences of which we'll come back to later, but from a hardware perspective it's no more capable than the original System 1, runs the same programs and is essentially the same thing. And a fine example of the system we have here too, this is pure 70s in its design. We've got wood grain, we've got chunky satisfying buttons, and we've got a font straight out of a 70s sci-fi movie. On the front, there's this front-loading cartridge slot which looks and feels like you're slamming an Elvis 8-track into your T-Bird, or in the case of us Brits, your Morris Marina. It's these big yellow cartridges which are part of the reason the system deserves to be remembered and preserved. The first generation of games consoles was occupied by the likes of the Magnavox Odyssey, Atari's Home Pong, Coleco's Telstar and others all of which had their games held natively within the hardware. The discrete transistor based game logic was hardwired into these devices, even in those which tried to disguise the fact like the Odyssey, which had interchangeable game cards. In reality these cards simply rerouted the circuitry in the console and there were no games stored on the cards. So they did nothing more than the switch on a Pong console which you'd slide to change the game from tennis to squash. The race to cash in on the video games market was on, and it was spearheaded by the little-known Alpex Computer Corporation, a company whose endeavours in the electronic cash register market were hampered by competition from the likes of IBM and NCR. Unable to compete with rivals with such a huge bankroll, they looked for a new market. Piecing together an appetite for more complex games, with emerging CPU technologies such as the Intel 8008 in 1972 and the 8080 in 1974, Lawrence Haskell and Wallace Kirshner set about creating Alpex's own console, codenamed Raven or Remote Access Video Entertainment, an Intel 8008 CPU based games machine. What they created was a working prototype. Measuring roughly 16 by 16 by 5 inches, it was stuffed full of circuit boards and it had a keyboard for input with a selection of interchangeable game modules. And in doing so, they filed patent 4026555. Let's take a look at the abstract and then we'll go into some more detail of what it actually means. Keyboard controlled apparatus for producing video signals for standard television receivers includes a random access memory having a multiplicity of storage positions, each of which corresponds to a pre-selected discrete portion of the TV raster. 
Data stored in the random access memory is sequentially read from memory in synchronism with the scanning of the television receiver so that a desired video signal is generated at each discrete position of the cathode ray beam. Data is read into the random access memory at preselected storage positions depending upon a particular image to be displayed. The data writing process is under the control of a microprocessor which is programmed to cause the stored image data to be varied in accordance with the condition of the user-controlled keyboard. Wow, there's a lot going on in that paragraph. But in essence, Alpex had filed the process of drawing an image in memory and flipping it onto the display through the use of a CPU and a stored program. Raster graphics which used stored images to rapidly display images on screen. The patent also states in its detail, the invention can be used to play more games than it is possible with known systems of this type, and it does not require overlay screens to establish boundaries or other constraints for different games. It's also more flexible in its capacity to accommodate individual skills and can be used to play games substantially more challenging than games available on known systems. It goes on to say the intelligence of the system is provided by a microprocessor which operates in conjunction with a memory comprising a read-only memory, or ROM. So, the patent also covers artificial intelligence achieved by the presence of a CPU and instructions stored on ROM. This is starting to sound very familiar. It then goes on to read, An advantage of the invention is that the apparatus purchased can be used to play games other than those for which it was specifically designed. This can be done by the use of appropriate programs which have the instructions for new games stored in ROMs which can be added as modular plug-in units to the existing device. Thus, as new games are developed, the programs can be purchased by owners of the basic system to increase its capacity virtually without limit. So, their patent also covers modular, plug-in ROMs, or what we can commonly call video game cartridges. Raster graphics, CPUs, AI, and removable ROM carts is very much the blueprint for the second generation of games consoles. The patent was awarded on May the 31st, 1977, having been filed in 1975. Alpex had the blueprint and indeed the working prototype, but they didn't have the finances to bring Project Raven to market. For that, they called on their old point-of-sales connections, namely Sean Fogarty, who was the rep of a semiconductor company called Fairchild, and he'd supplied them with components in the past. Fogarty got a demonstration of Raven and relayed his experience to Greg Rays, Fairchild's vice president of consumer products. Enter now. Jerry Lawson, an engineer at Fairchild who was sent to see Raven and assist in a feasibility report in the device's suitability and ultimately if Fairchild should buy it. Lawson incidentally was also a member of the famous homebrew computer club frequented by the likes of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Of them, he said, I was not impressed with them, either one of them actually. And he said he once interviewed Wozniak for a position at Fairchild but he didn't hire him. Jerry assessed the Raven and the team concluded that if the input method, which was currently a keyboard, was simplified and the CPU changed to Fairchild's own creation, it offered good potential for the company. They projected 5.5 million sales by 1978, and that's what the execs wanted to hear. So with that, Raven, which had somehow picked up the new codename Stratos, was purchased and Fairchild set about bringing the console to market. That console would finally be named the Fairchild Video Entertainment System, which made its debut at the Chicago Consumer Electronics Show in 1976, and it would finally be renamed the Fairchild Channel F or Channel Fun. It was then the first ever home games console to offer games as ROMs on plug-in cartridges paired with a CPU, and it wouldn't be the last, not by around two more decades, when the CD-ROM format became the norm for consoles. These then are the world's first home video game cartridges with ROMs on to make it to stores. Let's take a closer look at those cartridges and the system itself. Two cartridges are bundled with my channel F. They're all numbered with 27 official releases. You can no doubt guess from the size of the game's library that the system wasn't exactly a roaring success, but we'll come to that later. Of those 27, 21 were released by Fairchild and the remainder by Zircom, who we'll come on to shortly. The games retailed at $19.95 each and some carts contained multiple games. So, were these the first cartridge-based video games compilations? I think they must be. 
Video Cart 1, which was bundled with my system, has on it Tic-Tac-Toe, Shooting Gallery, Doodle and Quadradoodle, all on one cart. In addition to the bundled cartridges, two games were built right into the console, and these are Hockey and Tennis. So out of the box we have a pretty good selection of cartridges and built-in games. Certainly more than Nintendo 64's American launch title selection of two cartridges. Ok, that's not really a hard stat to beat. At the time of launch, two other companies were developing consoles. RCA with the Studio 2, also designed with removable cartridges, and Atari, who had employed a man named Doug Hardy, an engineer who had helped design the cartridge mechanism on Fairchild's own system before leaving and being picked up by Atari. Fairchild Semiconductor started out life as a division of Fairchild Camera and Instrument. They were at the forefront of transistor and integrated circuit development, and so were very well placed to produce their own CPU for the system. Jerry Lawson replaced the prototype Intel CPU with the Fairchild F8 CPU. It would later be used in the Video Brain computer system in 1977, and according to the CPU Museum it was the world's leading processor in terms of sales in 1977. Here now is the board from a Channel F System 1, remember mine is the later System 2, so it looks a bit different. I don't think the System 1 was ever officially available here in the UK. The 8-bit CPU is clocked at 1.79 MHz on an NTSC system. On my PAL system that's 2 MHz. The system has 64 bytes of RAM and 2 kilobytes for the frame buffer. Not a great deal, but enough to implement basic AI in games and to draw the screen in memory before flipping it onto the TV. Until this time, all games on home consoles had been player versus player or player versus themselves. AI was now appearing in arcade games such as Tato's Speed Race and Atari's Quack in 1974, but it had yet to reach the home. Now, even if it was in the form of a basic decision tree used by the computer opponent in Tic-Tac-Toe, AI was plotting against owners in their very beige living rooms. And I can tell you, in the case of Tic-Tac-Toe, it's utterly relentless. How about a nice game of chess? On the graphics front, the Fairchild could produce software sprites of one colour from a palette of eight at a resolution of 128 by 64 with 102 by 58 pixels visible on the screen. In 1979, Fairchild Semiconductor were bought out by Schlumberger. That same year, the rights for the Channel F would be sold to Zircon International, who repackaged the whole thing as the Channel F System 2, an exercise in mostly cosmetic changes. The joysticks were made to be removable, and audio was fed through RF into the TV instead of using a speaker in the console. The whole package was shrunk down, and you can see how much more refined it is here inside my console, but it was essentially the same console. In the three years it had been on the market, just 21 cartridges had been released, and six more would appear under Zircon's ownership. Let's pop the lid back on and see what it can do. Aside from the buttons on the console itself, interacting with the console comes in the form of these… joy… things. Looking like something from the mind of HR Giga, you grip the stick in one hand and the cap on top is manipulated in eight directions. It can also be twisted, like a paddle controller, pushed down for a fire button, and pulled up. It's really quite a versatile controller. A later iteration, named the Jet Stick, would add a trigger fire button to the front of the stick, and the joystick proved to be so popular, it was later released as the Video Command Joystick for the Atari 2600. So we've got our joysticks, we've got our fancy CPU powered console, and we've got a stack of games kindly loaned to me by James and Colleen over at Let's Talk Retro. The question is, what should we play? Well I noticed someone else had been streaming the Fairchild recently and putting a lot of hours into exploring the library, so I asked her what her experiences were and what we should try, and here's what Erin at Erin Plays had to say. Hey guys, I'm Erin from Erin Plays and I wanted to share with you my top three choices for the Fairchild Channel F. So my first pick is Video Cart 21, Bowling. This one really surprised me. I had no idea that I would ever find a bowling game this fun. It took me a little bit to get a hang of the controls. That's because the little knob on the controller, you have to like twist and pull it in a certain way. But once you get the hang of that, you can totally aim the ball and knock down pins. And it's really fun. And I actually didn't want to stop playing. So I totally recommend this one. My second pick is video cart number 18, Hangman. 
I mean, there's really not much to say. It's the classic children's game, Hangman, you know, that you would draw on notebook paper in elementary school. And they just did a really good job at making this into a video game. It's another one that's great to play with two players and you'll find yourself actually playing it for a while. <laughs> like it's just a simple but fun game. And my third pick would be Slot Machine, video cart number 22. Basically I wanted to bring this up because I think the graphics on this are pretty impressive for the time and for the system. You know, it's just like a little slot machine where you see if you get, you know, three in a row or whatever. It's fun to play for a few minutes. It's just definitely worth checking out because I think they did a really good job with it. And lastly, I would like to recommend checking out the Pong type game that comes built onto the system because it's really fun to play it with the Fairchild controllers and I just wanted to throw that last recommendation in there. <laughs> okay, so those are my top three, well I guess four, game picks for the Fairchild. Thank you to Erin and there's a link to her channel in the description to this video so do please check her out. So to get a good feel for the system I set about playing the games Erin recommended with a live stream on Twitch. And I have to say the standout game for me was drag racing. A simple race against each other or the clock which makes full use of the quite unique controller. Twisting to the right is the accelerator and with it twisted you then use the stick to engage gears in an H shift pattern shifting gears before blowing the engine and trying not to stall. It made for a very involved and enjoyable experience that I felt got the most out of this unique controller. Having recently covered the Commodore TV game Pong system on the channel, it gave me some great context in which to enjoy this system. What we're seeing is not up to the standards of Pitfall, Space Invaders or Pole Position on the Atari 2600, but you do get the sense that a whole world of possibilities has opened up compared to the variations of bat and ball offered to us on those Pong consoles. And here's another interesting aside about the Channel F games. It's a common misconception that Warren Robinette's adventure from 1979 on the Atari 2600 is the first cartridge with an easter egg in it. Well the Channel F has some easter eggs of its own, and one in particular interest is from Wizball in 1978. By following a very specific set of commands, it has this easter egg squirreled away in it. Right. Earlier still is the Channel F demo cart. I'm struggling to find an exact date on this but it was released in 1977 and some sources point to September of that year. Holding down buttons 1, 3 and 4 at the end of the demo shows the programmer's name on the screen and that's two years earlier than Adventure. Could this be the first easter egg on a games console cartridge? There are earlier examples in arcade cabinets such as 1977 Starship 1 by Ron Milner but I'm not aware of any earlier examples on a home cartridge. So why did the Fairchild Channel F fail? Let's start with something positive. It was the best selling second generation games console of 1976. Okay, it may have been the only one, but you still get your 25 meter swimming badge if you're the only one in the pool, right? The Channel F sold 250,000 units before production ceased in 1983. In a league table of second generation consoles, well, it's truly a minnow, especially in contrast to the 30 million sales of the Atari 2600. From a technical standpoint, it was largely outgunned by the Atari 2600 which had twice the RAM and a larger colour palette, and Atari had the backing of Warner to bankroll the launch and market the system. And so it can be concluded that the Fairchild Channel F was indeed a commercial failure. Its library of games is limited, and its rivals gave gamers everything it had to offer and a lot more besides. But what can never be taken away from this system is its place as the very first. The first console with ROM based cartridges and a CPU, the first to offer AI in a home games console, the first to break out of the Pong mold and to tease gamers with the possibilities of a limitless games library. But like my 25 meter swimming badge, even if I, like the Channel F, drowned when competition entered the pool, you still can't take that badge away from me. And you can't take away from the Channel F that it was there first. It proved that it was possible, and technically, it did it quite well with the resources they had available, it just didn't quite manage to capture the public's imagination in the same way that Atari did. As always, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed our look at the Fairchild Channel F today, and take care. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support. Ooh.